Greetings, everyone. In today's passage, we again meet Philip. Remember, Philip, like Stephen from last week, was one of the seven Greek-speaking Jews chosen to wait on tables to serve widows because they were being overlooked because of their ethnicity, because of their Greek speaking nature, they were receiving less than the Hebrew speaking widows. When persecution broke out in Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen, Philip, like other Greek speaking Jews, scattered. They scattered because they were Greek, not Hebrew. If you notice earlier a little bit In the passage, it says that the apostles did not need to leave Jerusalem at that time. They could stay there because they were Hebrew. But everyone who was of Greek descent, Philip, like Philip, was on the run. As a Greek speaker, he went to Samaria. In fact, he would probably be more familiar with Samaria that was Greek-speaking and more at home among the Samaritans than in Jerusalem. Philip is not of this world. He is of Christ, a new creation. He was scattered and he was sent. He is a refugee and he is an evangelist. They go together. Philip speaks the language of the Samaritan and he knew their culture and God chooses to do his will in the midst of persecution. Does God cause persecution or evil things to happen? No. But can God work his will in the scattering, in the persecution? Absolutely. And Philip is one of those examples where he's preaching God's word to those he encounters where he is scattered. He has compassion towards the hurting. Not only is Philip speaking God's word, he's praying for people to be healed and he's doing miraculous signs. When the Samaritans see these healings and signs, they pay very close attention to what Philip has to say. Sometimes signs and wonders and healings are a prelude for the gospel of Jesus, for Jesus to be lifted up and proclaimed so that people hear the good news and can respond. Well, the people, the scripture says in verse 8, there was great joy in that city. Wouldn't that be wonderful? to be a part of today, healing and gospel going together. It is a very fruitful ministry that Stephen has born out of persecution that scattered and sent him to an urban city in Samaria. We would be thrilled if salvation and healings and deliverance had happened at Midway Covenant as we are walking out God's calling of us as a church community. And right in the middle of this amazing, fruitful, uh, flourishing ministry, of salvation and healing and deliverances that's impacting the entire city, God calls Philip away. Has something like that 
ever happened to you? You were in a blooming, a blossoming, a booming job, or a a flourishing church, or a great neighborhood. Everything was going well. Then God came calling, asking you to move, to leave, to go to a new situation, a new city that you had never considered before. It happened to Philip, and Philip obeys, not knowing what he would encounter. There is much more to Philip's story in Acts chapter 8. And we'd like to go over them verse by verse. But we have a very special visitor with us this morning. And this special visitor and I would like to act out the verses that start with 20, 26. So if you will bear with us a moment, and we hope this is both true to the gospel and to God's word, as well as that you could smile or laugh. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, who was an important official in charge of the treasury of the queen of the Ethiopians. This Ethiopian eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? How can I? Yes, unless someone explains to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please. Who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. This is a wonderful passage of holy scripture that you are reading. It's about the one true God. I know that in Ethiopia, there's many gods that people worship. But this is about the one true God. And I can see that you understand you have a need. You cannot fix by yourself. Mm. You would not have taken three months, three months of travel by chariot to go to Israel's temple in the hope that you might get in. Unfortunately, you did not get in, did you? No. But on your long return home chariot ride, 
Here you are still looking for the truth in the scriptures. It's speaking. Those scriptures are speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, or the Christ, the anointed one by the one true God. That's what the scripture scripture is concerned with. Jesus of Nazareth. In another place, Jesus is speaking, and he says, ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone, anyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. And what I perceive, as I have walked along and you've been reading out loud the scriptures, is that you are seeking and asking for truth. The scriptures you are reading point to Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb. Jesus is God's holy, only begotten Son, whom the Father sent into the world as a man. Is fully God and fully man, and it is a big mystery, but it's true. He lived a sinless life, much It's hard to imagine someone living a sinless life. But he was perfect in God the Father's eyes in every way. He met the requirements, therefore, of a sacrifice. Perhaps you've heard of the Jewish sacrifices in all of your study and look at the Jewish faith that there's a Passover lamb and there's, there's the putting of sins and sending that lamb out into the wilderness. And at other times there's sacrifices uh, for, for the cleansing of sin. Well, Jesus lived a sinless life. You know, That scroll is about 16 feet long that you're scrolling through. And it is, it is revealing sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's, it's going my own way. My own thoughts, my own desires that are, are ungodly. They're not like the God of the scriptures that you are reading. And furthermore, sin is not neutral. Sin, if it's not checked with what I would call confession and repentance, if it's not checked, sin just keeps breeding and growing more and more and more. And perhaps you have heard of people who have certain kinds of addictions they just can't get themselves free from. It's where sin has grown and grown and taken a hold. But there is hope. We all have a need for cleansing and forgiveness that only God can supply through Jesus Christ. It's because of Jesus who was sinless himself and crucified on a cross where God laid all of humanity's sins upon Jesus. And there, though Jesus himself was a perfect lamb and God loved him immensely as his son, God pours out the necessary pain and suffering for human sin on his only son. 
He, he died on the cross as a Passover lamb for human sin. He is a, a sacrifice providing a way for our ongoing, never-ending, ceaseless relationship with God that even goes beyond my physical death. It's a never-ending, ceaseless relationship with God. See, it wasn't just that he was killed on the cross and buried. He rose. God rose his son from the dead in a resurrection body, in a resurrection life. And he appeared to his followers and over 40 days, he appeared with them and he was teaching them. And at one point, he appeared to over 500 people. That, that means it couldn't have been a mirage by his, his beloved followers. And he is alive today. We can have a, we can have a relationship with him and walk with him and talk with him and receive his love for us and love him back. The invitation is to put our confidence and our whole trust in Christ now. Then to act on that trusting relationship with him. To put our trust in him and then to Live out that relationship with him, learning to listen to him in the scriptures and in creation and through other Christians, through his church. It is life lived with Jesus that launches us into awareness of his kingdom will. He's got a kingdom. He's got a sphere of influence. He's, and he's got a will and a character and an attitude and it all lines up with his kind of kingdom. It's not like any other kingdom or queendom. Not even Candace's. And we enter into an interactive life with God and his kingdom as we participate in his church and especially through a sacrament we call baptism. Baptism is also a bit of a mystery. It's like baptism involves water and it's going down under the water as if to be washed from one's sins that separate us from a holy God and then to come up cleansed and renewed and to walk out that relationship. Baptism is something that's commanded by God to all of his followers. We do it in water. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. The one true God of Israel you've been seeking involves the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look here, is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Stop. Let me ask you, do you desire to trust and follow Jesus? I do. Jesus said to his followers, go make disciples. Those are like students of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he said, and you can be confident that I am with you always till the very end of the age. So it is upon your confession of faith and trust in Jesus Christ that I suggest we go into the water if you want to be baptized. Let's go to the water. Go to the water. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. <laughs> okay, let's, let's talk. Okay, we're back in our right minds. No, we're back in our right characters. Um, uh, again. And Pastor Sean, you were a great Ethiopian. Thank you. <laughs> a momentary. <laughs> a, a momentary, yes. Um, is there anything that you want to say that pertains to today and to us at Midway Covenant Church um, about this text of Scripture? Very prophetic, very prof especially right now. Um, I want to share something with the church. Uh, we had already discussed this passage even in our uh, staff meetings, and... Um, just yesterday, out of the blue, uh, a woman called me, and she had, I, I didn't get the answer, but I called her back, and I was like, yeah, I, I know you. I remember she used to come here uh, to this church, and she asked me, she said, well, the reason I called you is I, I would like for you to baptize my two boys. I got a, a 18-year-old and a 20-year-old. Uh, they're believers. They just never been baptized. Uh, will you baptize them? And they they live in this community. And I, I, I'm like, God, what are you saying right now? You know, what are you doing? What are you doing in all of this? Uh, we're talking about baptism in this passage, um, and I'm I'm conflicted. Uh, they're not a member of the church, of this church, or any church that I know of. And so when we do baptize, this is something that we are asking God to acknowledge, to, to, to partake in this mystery, to, to impugn whatever uh, he is impugning in this process. It's not something to be taken lightly. It is one of the two sacraments that we have in the covenant. And so, but they asked me, she asked me, a mother seeking baptism for her children. Um, I'm conflicted. I, I, I hear that. And, and we've talked a little bit about that because um, we do have two sacraments and they, they, they belong to the church, the sacrament of Holy Communion and the sacrament of baptism. So it's most often that we do those in community. And I've already shared with you my wish that um, there would be an invitation, especially since we're opening this sanctuary up on August the 2nd for this, this mother and her sons to come here and for us to get to know them and, and to make sure these young men 
have an understanding of what baptism is, what it means to be in Christ. And um, instead of doing this uh, down by the water, just you and mom and the two boys, it, it, that's what we've talked about a little bit. What does this mean? And I think what we would like to ask is that the congregation pray. Because here is this amazing, wonderful encounter that Pastor Sean has had. Out of the blue, he gets the call. And he has known this woman. And historically, she's been here. Well, will we pray together as a community? Lord, lead them back. And let us, let us as a community stand as witnesses to the baptisms. That's what, that's where I'm praying. But I trust you, brother. Mm-hmm. I trust your heart for Jesus and heart for the Lord. But it's great. It is so great for our church to have a conundrum like this. Is it not? Can I get... 30 amens. Amen. All right. That is, there's so much more we could say, but we will, we will keep you past your lunchtime. So we invite the, our, our worship in song team. And I want you to know that I will always seek to call them worship in song team because it's not just the worship team. Worship entails all of life. Worship is the proclamation of the word as well as the prayers that are prayed. It's about us being light out in the world. So I like to call them our worship in song team. The Lord bless you and may he bless this word and will you pray with us? for these two young men. Amen.